welcome, friend. To the how-to heretic. I'm Uncle Mark. I'm Uncle Dan. I'm Uncle Doug. And this is your user's guide to life on the outside. That's right. Leaving religion is the first step into a larger, better world. But it can also be a scary world. Things work differently now. Never fear. That's why we're here. We're your audio uncles. And with help from good friends and experts in all sorts of fields, we're going to share the stories and seek the knowledge to build a great life. After all, you only get the one that we know of, so you'd better make the most of it. Well, uncles. Yo. How do do? How do do? I uh, Dan is back from Spain. I am back from the land of the dead. Yeah, and uh, and feeling kicky. So we got, it's, we got all three uncles. Yeah, and we had to do a little little scramble on our side. Oh my God. Uh, there's a storm hitting our area, and internet was out at both of our houses. So we had to avail ourselves of a of a third location uh, of an undisclosed uh, location, a bunker. Yes, an, of, of, of even more undisclosed location, but that is the love we feel for you all. That's right. To do yeah. such things as to drive a couple of miles to a different place. So, Scurry over to somebody else's house. So you're welcome. Here's episode 121, uh, fresh off the press. I am going to talk about uh, Heaven's Colored Only Entrance with uh, <laughs> Jane Manning James. And it's, it's, a, it's a real rib tickler, this story. Oh, yeah, it's, a, it's sure a treat. I'm mm-hmm. going to take on the last half of the book of Genesis and put it to bed, hopefully forever. Oh, yep. w- would that that were the case. Would that yeah. that were the case. And I am going to talk about art. Do you guys art? like art? That's oh, what like I'm going to talk about. I like yeah. art. Like uh, uh, Tom, you Thomas Kincaid, you're John McNaughton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know much about art, but I know what I don't like. Mormon Rockwell. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about some art. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Uh, not too many tears this episode, so that's a nice change. Uh, so join us, won't you? <laughs> you already are. Let's continue. <laughs> yes, let's move on. Hey, Uncle Doug. Uncle Dan. You know, uh, one of my favorite places to visit in here in Salt Lake City. Yeah, is the Salt Lake City Cemetery. I know it is. It truly is. I go there all the time. Yeah. Uh, I love it. And uh, one time I went there and I, you know, I just sort of tootle around to different parts and see yep. who's buried where. And I saw a gravestone <laughs> for, uh, that, that had a, a whole bunch of like engraved brass. And I was like, I don't, I don't, what is that? And I went over and, uh, and it's the person that uncle Mark is going to, uh, is going to tell us about. Yeah. yeah. And, and we should mention that that, that cemetery for those of, our listeners who've never been to it or haven't been to Utah is arrestingly beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Truly beautiful. Cemetery. Yeah. Yeah. Nestled up into the, into the foothills of the mountains. Mm-hmm. It's, it's uh, it, one, one time just uh, last summer, I happened to be there when a migration of butterflies was coming oh, through wow. and I just oh, got wow. to be surrounded by millions of butterflies. Very cool. That kind of shit just happens there. It's a magical place. It is. It, it is also the resting place of, Oh, so many of Mormon history's uh, goodies and baddies. Yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. Um, and but today let's talk about one that I think is kind of a, a goodie, and I, I like this one. So yay! Yes, we, we're we're not we're not well. Villains will be discussed, but the topic of our uh, of our discussion today is actually not a villain, which is refreshing. I think <laughs> <Yeah>. so. <laughs> So, you know, as you guys were alluding to, we've, we've been around the big square block of Mormon history and all things Mormon generally many a time, but we can still be caught by surprise. And though I'm now much more knowledgeable about today's subject, I was caught off guard about it right here on this very show <laughs> when our friend Bryce Blankenagle, amateur Mormon historian par excellence and host of the Deep Dive Mormon History podcast, Naked Mormonism, mentioned her in episode 29 – I was, of course, shocked, though by now we should find nothing in Mormon history shocking or, conversely, everything in Mormon history shocking. Right. <laughs> so I've read quite a bit, even touching uh, on her myself in my uh, review of the most excellent Mormon book, The Church in the Negro, in episode 87, which I recommend everybody read. Mm. Um, so let us cut to the chase and dive into discussing the incredible life and peculiar circumstances of Jane Manning James, uh, a true pioneer badass and a most remarkable woman who, uh, even against crazy odds, refused to take no for an answer. So, uh, born Jane uh, Elizabeth Manning in uh, May of 1813 in rural Connecticut, 
Uh, Jane was from a free black family long before the issue of slavery in America was, air quotes, resolved <laughs> by a civil war and the Emancip <laughs> Emancipation Proclamation. Editor's note, it really hasn't ever been resolved. But – in 1813, it was still 50 years away from any attempt at resolution. Right. Uh, young Jane was sent away to live, li live with and naturally serve a white family, uh, a period of 30 years about which little is known other than she was raised and baptized a Presbyterian by her host family and bore a son named Sylvester. Uh, hmm. <clears throat> then one fateful day in 1842, two Mormon missionaries stopped by the home of the family Jane was living with, and for whatever reason, her interest was piqued. Her Presbyterian minister forbade anyone from doing so, but Jane attended a Mormon service in uh, the next Sunday and was baptized a week after that. Oh, uh, and thus yeah, began poor. the worst things that could happen yeah. to her. And, and yeah, let's all well, remember, if, there was no Google in those days. So. Yeah, that's right. Also, if you were a black woman in 1842, every choose-your-own-adventure ended badly. So <laughs> that's true. She, this, was, this was one of the bad choices she was able to make, so... Uh, and it seems she was a pretty influential woman among her peers, so soon much of her family and acquaintances had joined up as well. So I want to take a quick second to talk about the idea of uh, hopeful religion hopping or the phenomenon mm -hmm. of people jumping religions because one promises a slightly better benefits package than the last one. Doug, as a Mormon missionary in an impoverished country, you may know a bit about this, <laughs> right? A bit of a connoisseur, you might say. <laughs> someone, yeah. someone who encouraged people to make the, the leap. Yeah. When, when Doug, by the time Doug baptized people, they were probably 10 religions in and had 10 more to go before they were finished, <laughs> right? So this was common during Jane's time, and it's no less common now, especially where poverty is endemic. Uh, and aside from all the racism, we'll, we'll get there in a second, Mormonism did offer things to the beleaguered of the early 19th century America that most other religions didn't. And those were all the land out west a heart could plow and the economic possibility that came with that. The democratization of priestly power and direct access to God and revelation, well, for men only, but still, and a sparkling utopian promise of health, wealth, and eternal life that was very attractive to denizens of the dismal slums and impoverished hollers of the old 13 colonies. Does it matter that the revelations and priesthood powers were things Jane couldn't have in the Western Mormon utopia? Well, she didn't have them in rural Connecticut, so might as well be fairly powerless someplace nicer, right? <laughs> And and that someplace nicer turned out to be the most recent of Mormon church founder Joseph Smith's New Jerusalem's, a sticky hot mosquito swamp, he was kind of an idiot, on the Mississippi River called Nauvoo, Illinois. And by God, Jane and her people, meaning Jane and eight of her family members, were determined to get there. How determined? So determined that when they walked all the way to Buffalo, New York, and found they couldn't afford the train fare, they said fuck it and walked 800 miles to get there. Jesus uh, Christ. Yeah. Jane wrote that uh, they wore out the soles of their shoes and then the soles of their actual feet, leaving footprints of blood behind them. Now, this and is then where... they wore out their ankles. That's and right. Then this knees. is where there was only one set down. of footprints, right? <laughs> Why were there only one set of footprints? Because the others were kind of stumps. Um, uh, uh, so that's wanting something pretty bad if you ask me. Also... Consider the straight iron balls of a group of black people walking 800 miles across the America of 1843, free or not, when the Mason-Dixon line, the demarcation between slave states and free, was the southern border of all the states they crossed. Yikes. Yeah. And just for fun, imagine a black family doing that in the America of 2020. Totes fine, right? <laughs> like, it's good. Look how far we've come, everybody. Oh, we did it. <laughs> so... Long story short, Jane and company arrive in Nauvoo, and she finds work and lodging with no less a personage than the, the, the Lieutenant General of the Nauvoo Legion, Prophet Seer, Revelator, Joseph Smith and his wife, his only wife as far as she knew, Emma. <laughs> <clears throat> like many people, Jane was impressed with the Prophet and declared him the finest man I ever saw on earth. Um, uh, she happily served and lived with the Smiths until Joseph got himself killed by a mob of his disgruntled former followers in 1844. Yeah, that'll happen. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a occupational hazard of being a prophet <laughs> slash rapist. Um, <laughs> one fine day before the impending murder, the prophet's mother Lucy bade Jane to bring her a cloth wrapped bundle from a shelf. 
She opened it to reveal a sort of spectacle thing called the Urim and Thummim. Ooh, she got to see the Urim and Thummim? She got to see the Urim and Thummim, which was supposed to be an artifact. <laughs> pardon me, getting over my cold here. Supposed to be an artifact made by pre-Columbian Jews, uh, the pre-Columbian Jews of the Americas called the Nephites, that survived thousands of years so that her son Joseph could translate the golden plates upon which was scribed the Book of Mormon. How about that? Well, except that just a few short years ago, Official Mormondom, without a word of explanation, unhappened the magic translating spectacles and replaced them with a little milk dud of a rock that Joseph <laughs> placed, placed in a hat he stuck his face into to translate the non-existent language of Reformed Egyptian into Elizabethan English. Sorry, Jane, you got retroactively punked. <clears throat> so. <laughs> so what What do we think was in the bundle? What do you think it was? Was it just a pair oh, of eyeglasses? He probably had some little doohickey, you know. There was he, no bundle... None of this happened. <laughs> we know that we know that she's a real person, but like the stories surrounding all of these things, I'm always just yeah. Well, this is from Jane. Apparently, that that's in Jane's own words. And mm. of all the Mormon accounts I've ever read, she seems the least liar. You well, know? Joseph uh, built some kind of golden plate facsimile. That he didn't show anybody, but he carried it around in a pillowcase. And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like he was he was into he was committed to the bit enough. Yeah, to make a wooden box and paint it gold. Yeah, or something he, like that. he could have made a Urim and Thummim. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was probably some doohickey he found and you know like an old piece of surveying equipment and stuck a crystal in it or something. But anyway, <laughs> any let's not get stuck in the Urim and Thummim again. <laughs> <laughs> but prior to that, Emma Smith, who seemed genuinely fond of Jane offered to adopt her and have her sealed to Joseph and herself. Uh, Jane declined, later saying she didn't really understand what was being offered. She might have thought it was some freaky frontier three-way or something, known by BYU historians as the <laughs> Nauvoo Ramiumptum. Um, but, yeah, little known, very rare, very beautiful. Um, well, that's why garments oh of the day God. had no kind of covering of the junk. You needed full access to... You know, in the oh hole. you could, uh, out, of, out of a crowd of a thousand people, if you threatened them with death, death if they're Mormon and you told that joke, the yeah. Mormon in the crowd would laugh. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> so, joking aside, for our never Mormon listeners, being sealed to a person means going through a ceremony in the very exclusive and, and secretive Mormon temples where you are bound to that person for all the eternities as either a husband or a wife or other family member. Right. If you're a, if you're a true believing Mormon, it's kind of a huge deal. If indeed Emma offered this to Jane, it speaks to a very unusual instance of top Mormon brass looking not only past the almost 100% universal racism of even the American North at the time, but also past the clearly spelled out doctrinal racism, 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 that's nicer, it's a nicer word, racism, <laughs> the doctrinal racism of the, of the church Emma's husband, Joseph, had so recently pulled out of his ass. Yeah. So... <clears throat> In short, and I'll make this very brief, what did, what did the Mormonism of 1843, and truth be told, modern Mormonism, because this is, shit is all still on the books, think about people of African descent. Note, mm -hmm. of course, we're all of African descent, some just more recently than others. So in short, is a basic overview of Mormon race theory, which is mine, and <laughs> here it is. In the beginning, Cain made an insufficient offering to the Lord shortly after his weird family got evicted from the Garden of Eden for a fruit-based misdemeanor fomented by a snake whose whereabouts remain unknown. Abel's offering was better, so Cain committed the first murder with malice and forethought and then lied about it. With me so far, it gets weirder. According to early Mormon <laughs> thinking, he did this because Lucifer had told him that it was Abel's seed through which Jesus Christ would be born, and neither of them wanted that. So Cain pre-crimed Abel to prevent Jesus from being born, which somehow happened anyway. Then Jesus' dad, in the form of the Jews, killed Jesus. Therefore, what the fuck is this hot mess of a stupid story anyway? But hold on, <laughs> any would-be scriptural racists out there, we got to rewind a bit. Before God made Adam, uh, Adam of mud and eat, eat Eve of dirt and then remade her without explanation from Adam's rib, before all that, there was a war in heaven. It's true. So there were both good guys and bad guys, but the worstest guys just couldn't make up their minds and sat it out. So those neutral spirits got to be born as black people. Got it? So then, like I said, Cain and Abel, but wait, then there was the all-loving God killed everybody but a guy with a boat and his family and two each of millions of carefully curated species. But as bad luck would have it, one of Noah's sons, Ham, had married a girl carrying the mark of Cain, meaning black, named Egyptus. 
Then his dad got drunk and naked and Ham Simon. And, and so, boom, obviously black people again. Then Ham and Egyptus left the family in shame and populated Africa. And their grandson became Pharaoh of the story of Exodus, described as, quote, first governor of Egypt. And critically to Mormons, Pharaoh was a real person named Ramses II, who was neither the first nor second governor of Egypt, but rather the third Pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. dynasty. So as you can see, please do believe everything Mormons have to say about race and everything else. <laughs> the math checks out. <laughs> So, now that everybody understands that, back to our friend Jane Manic James. For whichever of the blizzard of reasons I just laid out, Jane was black. So, <laughs> while she and her family and a very few others were on some level welcomed into the growing number of the westward bound saints, they were prevented by their pre-mortal sin from gaining <clears throat> rank or holding the priesthood. They were welcomed to pay tithing, they could do charity work, they could clean the toilets, but that was it. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so, <clears throat> after Joseph Smith's various long cons caught up to him in the form of a hail of bullets at the window of the Carthage jail, Jane found herself in the employ of the man who seized power, uh, from whom many thought would be uh, the rightful heir, the young Joseph Smith III, with his mother Emma acting as caretaker of the nation, a nascent prophet. Yeah. Br Brigham, as we've explored, was a monstrous piece of shit of the First Order, and a ferocious racist, even by the terrible standards of the day. Uh, he ordered the saints loyal to him to move west yet again, while Joseph's widow, Emma, and her son stayed behind in nearby Independence, Missouri. And I really don't know why Jane chose to move west with the evil Brigham rather than stay behind with the recently widowed Emma, who seemed like an actual friend to whom she must have felt some real love and loyalty. But move she did. So. Yeah. <laughs> Jane arrived in Salt Lake City among the very first pioneers in 1847. Uh, she and her remaining family comprised... Uh, I love Mormon history. She and her remaining family comprised one-third of the 12 African Americans in the state of Utah, and they were the only free ones. Yes, wow, Virginia. Man. Mormons up to and including Brigham Young owned slaves, one of which, a man by the name of Green Flake, drove Brigham's personal wagon and would later be given to the church as a human tithing payment. So that's nice. Oh, right, guys? oh my God. Fuck. Yeah, it's a true story. Um, Jane I just, and family. I just have to imagine Jane and her family. It, do you guys remember the scene in Blazing Saddles where the one black family is in a wagon train and they have, uh -huh. and then the wagons circle and they have to form their own circle when the Indians oh, come no. in? Oh, fuck. <laughs> yep, it's pretty much like that. Yeah, so... Uh, Jane and family, like their white neighbors, were soon suffering from, uh, from hunger under the dry Utah skies and Brigham Young's idiot uh, settlement ideas and agricultural ideas. A neighbor and her children were on the brink of starvation uh, after the wise church elders had sent her husband on a mission to California, which he accepted even though there wasn't so much as a crust of bread in the house for his children to eat when he left. Um, <clears throat> Jane split her meager flour provisions in half and gave them to her desperate neighbor. Generous indeed, but for some damned reason, this is the act for which Mormons seem to best know her, and is in fact, as Dan mentioned, immortalized in a bronze plaque on her gravesite, erected by a Mormon organization. Uh, her, church, her church remembers her for the time she gave half her flower to a white woman, so mm -hmm. why not? Jeez. So, Jane and family managed to survive the shitty early days of life in Utah. Her daughter... Marianne may well have been the first African-American born in the state of Utah, um, in the Utah Territory. Soon after the family had pulled themselves out of poverty uh, and they were doing okay, having caref been super careful with their money and land and, and managed to get a little uh, cash of livestock together, which is what passed for wealth at the time, so good for them. <clears throat> but here's the real kick in the petticoat of the Jane Manning James story. So serious was she about her eternal advancement so dedicated was she to a church that did not really want to have her as a member that she aggressively continued to petition the highest ranks of the church to be sealed to Joseph and Emma, uh, as, they, as Emma had originally offered her. And she was rebuffed every time. Um, before the doctrine of racism, weirdly enough, this is a whole other story for another time, became ironclad in Mormonism, the weird dreamer and founder Joseph Smith had ordained a precious few black men into the priesthood. There were black priesthood holders. Yeah. Um, one of them had made it all the way to Salt Lake City, a guy by the name of Quacku Walker Lewis. Uh, hmm. Side note, Quacker Walker, Quacku, sorry, Walker Lewis, a hero of the Underground Railroad in Massachusetts, 
hated his time in Utah. He was ignored and disdained by the, the Mormons who had been his friends out east and quickly left Utah after Brigham Young had it declared a slave state. <clears throat> Weird and shocking. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Why is, why is he so emotional? Right. <laughs> and again, even though she had a black priesthood elder willing to be sealed to her, her pleas were ignored. But she didn't let up. And let's pause to point out that even today, Mormon women are not encouraged to have very vocal opinions about, well, anything. Anything. <laughs> yeah. Anything. They, they, they're wearing pants to church almost caused a fucking revolution like three years ago. Right. Yeah. So yeah. this was a woman of, a, a woman of color. In the heart of a brutally misogynistic, doctrinally racist theocracy, and she was not going through a normal Mormon male authority figure chain of command, she was demanding her right to eternal guarantees from the first presidency of the church directly, whom she all knew personally because she'd served two prophets, right? Um, And this is in the 19th century. So that's just astonishing on its own. So persistent was she that the bigots who ran the place finally decided to come up with something to try to placate this relentless daughter of Cain. Are you ready for what the wise fathers at Temple Square came up with, guys? <laughs> it's it's they, just so good. They, uh, they put their big brains together and decided... Let, let us remember that these are the, the moral leaders of the community. These are yeah. the uh, the ethical and and godly men. The voice yeah. of God on earth. Yeah. yeah. And at the time, they were, all, they were the leaders of all things. They were the law. They were yes. the, the state oh, government, true. the city government. They were everything. So... Uh, they decided that the faithful servant, Jane Manning James, could indeed be sealed to the very white and delightsome Joseph and Emma uh, Smith for time and all eternity as a servant. <laughs> much, much like one of our patron heavens, Jane would get to live out forever folding towels and ironing sheets for white people. A fate death could not even spare her from. Jesus oh, my Christ. God. So, hey, black folks interested in Mormonism, did I just close the deal for you? <laughs> <laughs> so, and if that wasn't amazing enough, Jane was, un- one, was unable to even attend her own by proxy permanent in servitizing ceremony in the temple because black. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yes, of course. She Why would they let in. her in? That would be ridiculous. It was Joseph Fielding Smith and his wife were their proxy. Were the oh, my God. So, God. so <laughs> I, I, it sounds like through this whole story, Joseph Fielding Smith spent years just trying to make this woman go away. Right. Yeah. And, he, and he failed. So, <laughs> right. I bet most Mormons didn't know heaven has a service entrance. But I'm sure they'll rest easier knowing it does. So oh my God. Jane died nearly a decade later in 1908, still petitioning the assholes at Temple Square for her full endowments and ceilings uh, because for some weird reason she wasn't really down with the arrangement they made for her. Weird. At her funeral, her, her nemesis, Mormon prophet, then Mormon prophet Joseph F. Smith, kept the church's record of getting everything totally, horribly, almost comically wrong – by stating that in the resurrection, Jane Manning James would at last attain the longing of her soul and become a white and beautiful person. <laughs> oh, so, my oh, you didn't God. see that coming? Come on, Doug. So, uh, you so just are paying attention to this show. Jesus. So in short, fuck him, fuck them, and fuck all that noise. <laughs> but to, to conclude, take a minute to realize that none of us, and probably nobody listening to this, will ever be... Half the badass that formidable frontier woman Jane Manning James was. Yeah, truly. If you care to, as Dan said, and he can tell you where it is, you can visit her grave in the Salt Lake City Cemetery uh, where she is honored for giving half her shit to a white lady rather than driving the church elders half mad as they had to continually <laughs> confront their own racism at her behest. And I have a feeling, fellas, even if Sister Jane managed to get into the celestial kingdom via the colored entrance... <laughs> She ain't folding towels for a flock of teenage sister wives. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, yeah, I, th- it's she is probably one of the main reasons that Brigham and those following would make absolute pronouncements about how there will never ever be black people ordained to the priesthood or yeah, given maybe, full endowment. Maybe it was or, her. Maybe yeah. sh- it was just to get her to shut up. Yeah, which uh, which of course uh, they were correct about all the way up until the late seventies. Yeah, that's right. And right. and just a, as a coda on that, she the uh, so seventy nine seventy eight was the the rescinding of the racist 
policy outwardly, but it's right. still in the books, right? Yep. The following year, somebody went and did her temple work and had her uh, sealed and given her endowments. So, oh, really? Oh, yeah. So, good job, I guess. I think a little too little, a little too late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, by now she's white, thing. so it's all fine. <laughs> yeah, she's all good, but she's still now. She's, but but she's still a servant. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Uh, the God, God gives and God takes away. So that's Jane Manning James, guys. All wow. right. I, I'm uh, sad and confused. Let's move on. Let's move on. Uncle Mark. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I am not a. I am not a cultured man. I am not what you one would call a sophisticated man. No, you are not the yogurt of this podcast. You you're, are you're, the. A but brute, you are really. bland I'm, and I'm white. a simpleton. Yes, I know what I like, and I like simple things. <laughs> yes, I like a nice Beaujolais, mm. um, and you know. Now that's that's is that a kind of fruit? <laughs> well, originally, uh, originally, yeah, and, uh, and and mayonnaise, Beaujolais and mayonnaise, <laughs> I like Beaujolais and mayonnaise. <laughs> yeah, so you're you're Belgian. Have you ever had it. Beaujolais mayonnaise? <laughs> because that is the good Beaujolais. stuff right there. <laughs> oh. It's like the, oh. the fry sauce of the, the road region. <laughs> it's I, French, French fry sauce. Yeah. I need to change my diaper. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, uh, so it's, well, what, where do we turn? We don't yes. turn to Uncle Doug if we want c- culture. Where do we go? <laughs> well, where do we go, Uncle Dan? Well, uh, to Spain, apparently. Yes. Um, yeah, because uh, as our keen lister- listeners may remember... Uh, last week, I bragged about having recently traveled to and all around that fair country. Yes. And, oh, yeah. look, I am doing it again. Mm. Anyway, uh, while there, I experienced quite a lot of art, actually, from the Goyas, Rubens, and Caravaggios of the Prado to the Picassos and Dalis at the Reina Sofia to mm. the El Grecos at the Cathedral of Toledo to the intricate geometric designs that adorned the Granada's formerly Muslim palace the Alhambra. Mm-hmm. Nice. Uh, and quite a bit beyond that. Um, one thing that becomes clear as you travel in places that are older than our own little baby yoga, Yoda of a country is that religion is one of the most prominent, obvious, and annoying themes of art. Yes. Uh, it, it is a trend that goes back well before the Renaissance of the 14 and 1500s, uh, which is what I always picture when I think of religious art. Mm-hmm. It goes back before the Dark Ages. Yes. This is, we, it goes back before the Byzantine, the Roman, the Hellenistic periods, before the Indian, Chinese, and Japanese Buddhist art. There are literally Stone Age cave paintings going back tens of thousands of years depicting supernatural dipshittery. <laughs> Basically, religious art is as old as art and idiots exist. So... If, you, uh, if you've ever taken an art history class, which, Uncle Mark, I'm sure you've dropped out of one or two of those. Oh, well, uh, I, I got through a quite a few as well. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. that's good. Uh, you'll ha- you will have been taught and likely no longer remember that there are specific tropes in various movements of religious art. There mm-hmm. are common symbols and iconographic messages that, are s- that snooty art professors that I'm totally just making up in my mind because I never took an art history class will insist that you have to understand if you if you're to fully grasp the scope of the art that you're looking at. Mm-hmm. They're not. Here's wrong. the thing. Yeah, I know. Hey, here's the thing. I know. I, I literally think it's very interesting to know all that stuff, mm-hmm. to know that white often it indicates purity, while black can mean death and mourning, to know that the hand positions indicate that the Buddha is in different modes, or that a lion in Christian art can mean strength, but if it's carrying a banner, then it might refer to the tribe of Judah, but mm-hmm. if it has wings, then it probably it's probably referencing the Apostle Mark. Mm-hmm. Incidentally, if the lion is set, setting down an, an inexpensive Pinot Grigio to get up to go for a pee for the fir- third time in two hours, mm-hmm. then it's likely referencing Uncle Mark. Directly referencing <laughs> Uncle Mark, yes, that's exactly right. Uh, so there you go. Uh, it can be a useful shorthand to know all the little secret codes that artists have used throughout the ages in their religious art. But on this latest trip to Spain, I realized that for most of my art viewing life, I've been looking at religious art through their lens. Mm. 
I've been trying to see the meaning that they see in it, much like how we were trained to read the holy books by ignoring the glaring logical holes and obvious immorality contained therein. So this time, as I walked through the great galleries, I started to ask different questions. What is this art saying to me, Mr. Atheist Guy? Mm -hmm. uh, what... what and what is being presented to me on its face without any imagined professors telling me what I should be seeing? Mm -hmm. Because here's the, re the really interesting thing about all art. It's really not about the subject matter. Artists, from painters to writers to actors to dancers, use their subject matter to reveal something deeper about the human condition. Whether, whether they want to or not, artists are telling us something about the time they live in the anxieties and concerns of that moment in history. And they're telling us about the people who commission the art and what they want to see and what they don't want to see. And they're revealing things about themselves. They're showing us something about who they are, what's important to them and what their deepest fears and hopes might and be. And that they do not understand the anatomy of cats. That well, is also very important. <laughs> oh, there is so much anatomy that they don't understand, including I, human anatomy. Uh, man, there was one painting at the Prado that was a, a painting of Jesus. It was the, they don't allow you to take pictures at the Prado of mm -hmm. you know of any of their art, but that was the one I had to sneak a picture of because it was a Jesus that had abs that literally went above the nipples. I've they went <laughs> all the way up to his neck. <laughs> wow, neck abs. He so yes, a, he was uh, a strong anatomy carpenter. It wasn't always well understood, even yeah. by those who were really studying. Anyway, uh, I wanted to just show you fellows a few pieces of art that I saw on my trip mm. and chat with you briefly about what we see in them from our perspective rather than from the Christian one. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I shall try. I, you know, I, I did have quite a bit of art history, and, uh, and I did enjoy kind of getting the decoder ring. Yeah. You know, the key means this, the, the winged this, uh, the, yeah. you know. I, I, I did enjoy that, but I also believe that art is, is, should be a completely subjective experience uh, per viewer. So let's, uh, let's play the game, Alex. Yeah, I think, I think we should. Uh, yeah. Let's start with Diego Velasquez's Christ Crucified. This is mm -hmm. from 1632. That's wonderful. Um, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. And it's yeah. considered one of the sort of uh, landmark uh, paintings of, of the time. Yeah, um, I would say so. <clears throat> it, it's a, it, it is Christ uh, on the cross. Very little else. He's against a black background. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got the four nails instead of three. He went with a nail for each foot, which is, yep. uh, you know, that's an artistic choice. Here's what I wanted to get to. That's a generous Roman. That's a generous Roman who's willing <laughs> to do four instead of three. So yeah. I'm going to do you a favor. Count that as I a like win. Kid. <laughs> count that as a win. <laughs> so I was looking at this painting and here's what it occurred. What occurred to me. I see no pain in mm. this painting. There's mm. a man who should be experiencing insane amounts of pain. He's got the crown of thorns. He's got a nail in each hand, a nail in each foot. He's been stabbed in the side. Yeah. He's bleeding. Uh, he's got a very cute little diaper on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't see even a shred of pain, no. which to me yeah. is, is a really, uh, to me that indicates, I mean, he doesn't look, he doesn't look like he's wincing. He doesn't look like he's contorted. He almost looks he like if you take away the blood and you you imagine that you're looking at him from above, he could just be relaxing on a cross. He could also be very very stoned, <laughs> or, well, or just fully dead. But, or just fully dead. <laughs> but you know, it, as we've examined saints and and things over time, the idea there there's there is a much beloved Christian concept that martyrs smiled through their pain. Or or endured the pain without wincing. That's right. very important to the Christian. And I don't know we're not necessarily looking at this from a Christian perspective, but that's very important to kind of the Christian mystique of martyrdom, right? Well, and that's what I'm talking about here. Like one of the things that's interesting to me is the, is, is the mindset that says that a man could go through all of this and then just kind of be looking down like, mm, this will be over at some point. Well, and I, I also would just – so it's worth pointing out if listeners haven't pulled this up to look at. It, it's an extremely realistic painting. And we'll put, we'll put 
uh, links to these. Yeah. In the it, show is, notes. it is beautiful. The, the anatomy is excellent. The yeah. the execution is excellent. The light, especially. Yeah. The 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 sort of kind of chiaroscuro of the time is extraordinarily good. It's but it's, uh, it's, it's a masterwork. Uh, aside from the kind of perfectly placed linen wrapped around his his genitalia and his waist. Mm-hmm. Um, the the blood drip from dripping from his wounds it looks incredibly real he looks incredibly real it's kind of this amazing way of anchoring this moment in the real world like the yeah. artist it seems to me is trying to tell you that from his perspective this happened like this is what it would have really looked like yeah and yet again I I can't and and I hear what you're saying and yet he's just on a black background there's nothing behind him there's no there's no world in no. this world and. He's just chilling, but it's not abstract. Yeah, no, not at all. It's uh, it's no, no. There's nothing abstract about it. Uh, I just think it's very interesting uh, take on Jesus. And speaking of takes on Jesus, I want to move on now to. I was going to say it's also an incredibly uh, restrained amount of blood for Catholic depictions yeah. of, of the crucifixion and, oh yeah and before we move on, I want to know what diet Jesus is on. Is, is that keto? Right. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. It's it's the uh, it's it's the sweating blood out of every pore diet. Yeah. It's really it works great. I'm gonna download that app. Uh, I'm gonna move on now to uh, to an El Greco, uh, oh, yeah. Domenicos Theotokopoulos uh, is was his real name, so that's why the Spaniards decided just to never say his name. Call him the Greek. <laughs> just, call, just give him the Greek. Call him yeah. the Greek. Um, this is the Adoration of the Shepherds, uh, and this one. <clears throat> the lighting is particularly astounding in this. El Greco had this very weird style yeah. um, towards the end of his uh, his life. This may be his last painting. Uh, and it's, it's of the birth of Jesus. And Jesus is fucking glowing like a motherfucker. And everybody is uplit. And yeah. it's spooky and weird. <laughs> Does have kind of a horror movie. Mo- it's it's like looking into the briefcase in Pulp Fiction, and maybe that's what was in there was Jesus. But I <laughs> personally, I love as as a person who works in the arts and is kind of familiar with all this stuff. I I love El Greco. I think oh, that I do too. His his depictions of the human form, etc., were so radical at the time that they uh, you know obviously he's a, he was a huge influence on uh, Salvador Dali, who came along far far later. Right. But, you know, he and we'll talk about another person who was kind of maybe the father of surrealism in a minute. But this is uh, this is kind of surrealism and the attenuation of the human form, uh, I yeah. think, is extraordinary. And the color yeah. is also something that just. Is- yeah, his colors were were cra- like he there. It's funny because there are some uh, early El Greco's there as well that were very sort of dark uh, mm-hmm. portraits of Noblemen, Spanish and stuff. Gen- yeah. gentlemen, whatever, and then he gets into this stuff, and he's got these—he's got this one guy who apparently was probably his son, was the model for it, but mm. he looks like like a, a Frankenstein's monster mm. towering over the over the Christ child, right? And you know, Mary looks very calm, but everybody else looks pretty freaked out about this about this guy, including the angels floating above. Some of whom seem to be like trying to block their eyes from the brightness yeah. of the Christ child. Well, they've got thought, very sensitive little peens, those babies. <laughs> they should be careful about how radioactive, you know, how many, how many, how many rads Jesus puts off in an hour. Boy, speaking of little peens, check out the junk on Jesus. That is. There's, there's nothing there. No. I can't zoom I, in that far. <laughs> I feel like she might. It might be a Jesus. I'm not sure. I can't zoom in that far, but that really is just the software that the court put on my computer. So, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we should probably move on before I say the, too much. The point I was trying to make with the, with with each of these is that El Greco's like you know depicting a a, a moment that we that we all know. It's the birth of Christ. It's supposed to be the most important birth that has ever occurred on the face of the earth. Mm. And he chose to go real, real weird with it. Yeah, it's very the, the well, elongated, is, st- like the elongated limbs and fingers. Yeah, you know it's, the it tableau is a the way it's laid out. Supernatural moment, and you know maybe yeah. this is this is the way he decided to uh, 
to go, yeah, the perspective, your perspective is very low in the frame. Yeah. Uh, it's a very it long, feels, tall picture. I've seen this. It's huge, right? It's a, yeah, it's very yeah, strange. It's quite enormous. Yeah. And it, and it, and like I said, that up lighting just creates this weird shadows on everybody's faces. It, it really does look like yeah, they're looking nobody at else an was alien. doing this sort of thing. As far as I know, I, this was a very radical kind of departure. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, I, one more thing, one more, uh, there's one that I want to close out with because it's sort of the, the PS de resistance of my entire trip. But I did want to talk about, uh, in the Prado, they have a room devoted to one Hieronymus Bosch. Yes. Apparently they wouldn't, they weren't, the Spaniards aren't able to say his name either. So they just call him El Bosco. No, nobody's able to say his name actually. Hieronymus. <laughs> when I was in junior high school, when we first learned about Hieronymus Bosch, I thought Hieronymus was an adjective. <laughs> like, of all of the Boshes, yes. this one was the, he, most, he was the Hieronymus. most Hieronymus. You know what? It should be. This is it's fucking Hieronymus. Be. I'm making it happen. <laughs> this is, yeah, exactly. For, you heard it here first, folks. Go out and use it in a sentence today. <laughs> um, the first one, the first Bosch that I wanted to talk about is the Table of the Seven Deadly Sins. It's mm. literally a table. Uh, and Andrea and I stared at this thing. And each of the seven deadly sins is named, yeah. uh, w- which is which is nice on the thing, but named in a language that I don't know. Is it gula? So, for instance, is that what it gluttony says? is gula. Yeah. Um, and so we we challenged ourselves to look at each of the panels and figure out which of the deadly sins we thought was being depicted. Mm. And to be perfectly honest, when you look at it without like trying to, you know, without his perspective. What you see is just people fucking trying to live their goddamn lives. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind you of jumping. See... A, I'm jumping ahead, looking at, at at several of the the seven deadly sins that you've posted. Uh huh. If you didn't tell me these, uh, other than the one where maybe they're eating a little too much, if you didn't say that these were part of the seven deadly sins, it looks like normal scenes from life, except a guy's got a table on his head in one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. The only one I can easily identify is gluttony. Yeah, the rest of them, and even that one, I'm just like, I don't know. You know, you, there's one that looks like a woman facing away from us with a lampshade on her head, but I think <laughs> that's supposed to be just a veil, and it's called, and that one's pride. Well, <laughs> why is that pride, and why is know. it so bad? There is a little demon. Oh, l- I see the demon. Behind, oh, he's holding the her. mirror. He's holding the mirror for her. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so okay. But it's just a woman looking in a mirror, for right. Christ's sake. Like, well. these are the things that we're taught we're, are supposed to be the worst thing. Okay, what, what, what is with the guy with the table on his head? <laughs> well, that's wrath. And uh, A fight I seems to really... have broken out. A fight seems <laughs> to have broken out. Yeah, it's, what, it's very funny. There are three figures in the wrath panel. Uh, there's one guy, two guys who are wielding knives, one woman who seems to be dancing with one of them, <laughs> and one of them has... A table on his a head. A table on his. I think she's trying to stop them from fighting. I think yeah, she's I think intervening. So yeah, yeah. She's she's stepping in. Uh, they're both dumpy and weird looking, and it's a very funny panel. There's a perfectly and I like good it a lot. hat on the ground, which is crazy. <laughs> but yeah, but you know, sometimes you want a little <clears throat> bit more protection than a, a felt hat can offer, so you put you know a small end table. <laughs> An Nvidia, uh, which means you know uh, 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 envy. That's right. It well looks done. like a, just a normal street scene of neighbors having a chat. Yeah, there's a couple dogs chilling. Yeah. There's a guy there's holding a, a bird. Uh, you don't necessarily see any, you know, there's... And they're kind of pastoral and, like, you know, it's like they it, 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 unmenacing. It's like yeah. they're, right. they're, if you know Bruegel, like the, the Bruegel paintings, which were yeah. literally just scenes of rural life, right? They were just peasants dancing and carrying right. on, but it wasn't really... It wasn't really an indictment of peasant life. It was no, just... right. I personally have never been a fan of Bruegel. I thought he was way too Hieronymus. <laughs> he was, he he was, was borderline actually, Hieronymus. <laughs> listen, there was a Bruegel in the next room over from the from the Bosch room that was mm. astounding, though. A, look up. Oh, some, it was called something like uh, the Triumph of Death or Death something. Mm. If you guys, I, I don't have this pulled up for you guys, but it's amazing. It is Game of Thrones. Perfect. There, there is the, there is a, an army of skeletons charging in. It's terrifying. Oh yeah, and yeah, that crazy. was about the plague. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So anywho, uh, so and 
what was amazing to me about about the la- the uh, the seven deadly sins table is mostly just that it's like yeah we're just looking at normal life and he's trying to pathologize it into the literal worst things that humans can do well and here's and that's kind of the whole that's kind of the whole kit and caboodle with these with these people is here's what's funny about Hieronymus Bosch though is he was the father of nightmares like yeah. Bosch if he wanted to depict something fucked up it was not a problem for him so <laughs> well just like three people standing in a little house it does not look that nightmarish to me right exactly <clears throat> and with that we'll use that as our segue into the final piece that i wanted to talk about Bosch's the garden of earthly delights yeah it is a triptych uh that folds up if you ever wanted to which you would be put in jail if you tried to do <laughs> It um, makes it easier but, to steal, so give it a shot. Yeah, exactly. You, 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 who knows? People yeah. stole all kinds of art. Uh, this one has... So the three panels, there's the one on the left, which is the Garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. There's the middle big panel, which is uh, the, the Garden of Earthly Delights. That's the now. That's, the I guess, this phase of of the world. And then there's the right panel, which is hell. And boy, is it hell. <laughs> and all of these panels are, let me see what if, if I can come up with the word, crazy. Yeah. All of these panels are insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, 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 the one on the far left, our Garden of Eden, is meant to be uh, a sort of beautiful uh, utopia with critters all over the place, many of which he just invented out yeah. of his little <laughs> coo- cuckoo brain. Absolutely. And let's place this in time. This is a, this is a, about a 500 year, little over 500 years old. Yeah. This so is, this, is, this uh, is from early 1500s, maybe 1500, 1505, somewhere in that yeah. range. So yeah. <laughs> amazing. This, this predates, uh, like, like you were saying, this predates um, actual uh, surrealism by a by damn of sight. Yeah, by and nobody of was years. nobody could he, like how how he came up with any of this stuff is astounding, uh, astounding. How he came and, up with this and was not declared a witch to me oh, right? is really sure. kind of crazy, right? Because, because he could have been ex- gobbled up. Because yeah, invented critters is one thing. Like a you know a dog that only has two front legs and and a tail is one mm-hmm. thing. But if you move on to the next panel. Which is the the gr- Earthly Delights panel? Yeah, it's bonkers. It's bonkers, are, and it's very sexualized. Yeah. It's oh a, yeah, it's, high, it's it's a lot of nudity and very very sexualized behavior. Yeah, is anybody wearing clothes? I don't think anybody's wearing uh, clothes. There, I see There's, a guy in a red uh, poncho right in the middle. Yeah, a couple people are wearing berries, but he's whatever. probably and just he, like a healthcare provider, right? So. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And you guys, there's a, a online. There's a, a wonderful like uh, high res zoom in and check it out uh, version of this. And you can listen to uh, a very David Attenborough type person talking about each of the things. He doesn't ever mention things like the guy that's bent over and the other guy is using his butthole as a flower vase. Yeah, I was just looking uh, at that. Weird. I was drawn to that. Um, <laughs> it's very strange. <laughs> yeah. But he does talk about like giant birds in the picture and a bunch of people riding, a bunch of men riding around uh, in a circle on beasts, various beasts, goats, yeah. deer, whatever, with all of the, with a bunch of women corralled in a hot tub in the middle. Yeah. Um, there there are black people. It is out of control. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Completely out of control. And this was, of course, Bosch's idea of the bad things, the sin. <laughs> That's right. Which everybody seems to be having a great time. It yeah. looks like if Burning Man was held someplace nice. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where there was yeah, water kinda. and grass, right? Yeah. There are like these really crazy floating boats that are cool. There's all sorts of stuff. There's one guy doing a handstand in the water, holding his, yeah. but his hands are holding his junk and his legs are, he's just, everybody's have everybody's like literally just kind of having a great time. Yeah. Which leads us, of course... To hell. Yeah. yeah. Hell where a pair of ears will wield a knife at you. Where where half of a body, half of a torso uh, with two arms going to, that turn into tree trunks yeah. being supported by boats 
is a jail cell uh, in well, the, yeah. we we know it's held because on top of that that structure is a giant bagpipe. And, yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> and then one of the other largest figures in in the image is a gigantic hurdy gurdy. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Why not? So there's and, there's uh, music. There's music in hell. And there's a bird that's now eating people and shitting them out uh, through a chamber pot. There's, and of course, uh, the anal play is out of control. It is everywhere in hell. Hell is all about bum stuff. So uh, it's just, you know, it's one of those things where uh, Terry Gilliam would look at it and be like, dude, a little over the top. Yeah. You, uh, there's, a, there's those disembodied ears with a, a knife sticking out from in, in between them. And it's <laughs> yeah, a very phallic nature. Some yeah. stabby um, comedy shop ears. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, it's just, I guess what, it, what occurred to me as I, as I sort of stared in awe and wonder mm-hmm. at this bizarre work, the, clearly the work of a mad genius. Yeah. What I realized was, that the story that he has been told his whole life and that he clearly took on as real is fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> you think? The story, but the story itself, the one that everybody believed yeah. about the, the most human thing in the world, which is sex or the, mo- you know, the, or just human curiosity about, you know, what happens if I stick a flower in my bum? I don't know. Maybe yeah. I'll try it. Well, it's also, it's also uh, yeah, you're right. And it's, it's the, t- the Christian terror of the natural world. Yeah. When to, to us, both the first and the middle panel look a, a little weird. It's kind of, a, you know, a party that you should be told in advance what's going on. <laughs> right, yeah. But even if you showed up and you weren't ready, you'd be like, okay, give me a few minutes. I can get into this. It yeah. just looks it looks kind of amazing and and wonderful and it's people experiencing nature in some way via each other and via the the literal natural world and nobody seems to be getting hurt by anybody it's else a beautiful nobody day. Is, no, nothing's going against anybody's uh, own volition so what I so what I came to what I finally realized when as I stared at this was the only people who belong in hell are the pricks that are standing in judgment over these people hmm. having a good time. Yeah. Like, it's, it, it is the onlooker who is looking at this center panel and thinking something horrible is happening yeah. that, needs to, that, that needs to really uh, reevaluate themselves. Yeah. Can you imagine Not this used to scare the time. shit out of people? Like the, when this was opened on Easter, you know, because well, a lot of these, these things that are, are multi-paneled, they would close. Uh, all but for right. a certain time of year, the Feast of St. Stephen or something, right? Then they would be opened and the the peasants could view it. And it, this probably ruined people's sleep for the rest of their lives. Yeah, probably, Truly. You literally, know? like you see some of these images and you're just like, oh, my God. I, I'm not sure how, what kind of brain came up with this, but I'm pretty sure that now that it exists, we're all doomed. <laughs> yeah, but just from an art perspective, he is probably the father of surrealism. So uh, swing and a miss there, Hieronymus, but uh, yeah, good job. I just, it's definitely worth looking at. Uh, we'll, we'll put links to everything in the show notes and definitely check it all out. But yep. I just think I, I think what we can do is look at these and take as our – take their perspective as our jumping off point and then ask the real questions, which are like, what's going, what's actually going on here? Yeah. And, and I, remember, and I, remember that art is a reflection of those who pay for it. So yeah. the, the money in, the, in this period of time, the only money there was outside of a few just rich individuals was in the church. So that's, that's what the art was about. Right. Yep. So there yeah. you go. So when you go forth, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, nieces and nephews out into the world and regard the art don't take their word for it enjoy it on your terms and and let it teach you your lessons and if you steal this we'll give you a p.o box number and uh no questions asked (laughs) exactly (laughs) all right let's move on let's move on dear uncles hello uh we we do this uh Weekly, we, mm-hmm. we, 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 as we said earlier, we go out of our way to make sure it happens, yep. hell or high water, yeah. or 
a little bit of snow. To give you all out there an ad-free product. Yes, indeed. Uh, and some of you care to uh, kick in a few bucks just to make sure that we keep going and to show your appreciation. And we sure do appreciate it. Absolutely. So yeah. uh, we have some folks that we'd like to thank uh, on that front. So thanks this week. Go to Alec, to Hypatia, mm. oh. to Brian, mm. and I owe a heaven to Nat. Oh, I, hey, I, Nat. I, I was oh. unprepared last week. Uh, I was jet lagged and crazed. So that's thank so. You, thank you for your patience, Nat. But yes, I, think, I think it's probably about to be rewarded. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Here we go. Here's the thing, Nat. We spend a lot of time on this show trying to come up with what version of heaven might, what a version of heaven might look like. It can't just be sitting on clouds blissfully playing golden harps because that is obviously stupid. I also don't think that it can be a big hedonistic orgy where everybody is both excited and relieved at all times. Mm -hmm. We can't be too reductive with heaven because if we're going to spend eternity somewhere doing something, then that idea has got to be huge because too much of anything is just that too much. So I tried to come up with a heaven for you, Nat, that was enormous. Something so vast and expansive, even that even given eternity, you could never grow bored or weary of it. I searched for the vocabulary to describe a heaven that might actually, honest to God, be good. Hmm. But I couldn't come up with one, so you get ham. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Nat. I'm sending you to ham heaven. I hope you're not vegan. Look, I don't want to or be Muslim. that. <laughs> right, exactly. Or, or Jewish. Oh, well. Who cares? I don't want to be that guy who goes on a trip and then that's all he can talk about for three months. So I'm really trying to tone it down to two months. Anyway, I don't know if you've ever been to Spain, but the ham there is a delicacy that is prized throughout the world. A treat that can fetch incredible prices because of its rich, subtle flavors and beautiful texture. The Spanish ham of note, Himan Iberico. That mm -hmm. Iberian delight that, derived, uh, that is derived only from black Iberian breed of pig, or pigs that are at least 50% of that breed, if you want to get technical. Now this is heaven... So I'm not going to skimp on you. You're getting the good stuff. Black label, 100% jamón ibérico de belota, which, Uncle Doug, do you know what belota is in Spanish? Belota. Pelota or bel belota? B-E-L-L-O-T-A. Bellota, no. Oh, bellota, that's right. Yeah. That's acorn ham, baby. Ooh. And it is the pure dope. Let me tell you something. This ham starts out as adorable little piglets, who, as soon as they are weaned, are fattened on barley and maize. Wow. I, I, I would say corn, but Wikipedia said maize, and I don't know if there's actually a difference there, so I'm just going with maize right now. Anyway, after several weeks of uh, grain chubbying, the pigs are set free. Is grain chubbying a technical term? I'm sorry it, to interrupt. It is now. Okay. I, I, I invented that word, but I don't see why we shouldn't all use it. It's making me hungry. Yes, indeed. Uh, the pigs are then set free in the oak forests on the border of Spain and Portugal. Doesn't that sound nice? Yeah. They roam around the forests eating mainly acorns and chestnuts, olives sometimes, you know, roots, whatever they can find. It's the high life. Yeah. Hog heaven, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not really hog heaven because it's your heaven. And, ha and the hogs are about to die. Oh. They gather them bitches up, slaughter them, and then lop off the legs, because that's the hammiest part, apparently. And then they salt and dry those legs whole and uh, for at least 12 months. And voila, or whatever the Spanish equivalent to voila is. It's <laughs> ham! Yes, and not just any ham. Rich, buttery ham with a depth of flavor that will knock your socks off. Mmm, you can actually taste the nuttiness that comes from the acorns. Mm. But before you can really taste it, you'll have to carve it from the leg, which is actually really hard, and people t lose fingers and all parts of hands and stuff in the process. Huh. But we'll get you a really sharp knife and maybe even one of those chainmail gloves so that you don't hurt yourself, which I literally saw a guy using to cut the, uh, the ham off of, a, off of a leg. And that's it! 
Congratulations, Nat. You know, on your ham. <laughs> and enjoy your heaven for all eternity. Amen. There are some people who would look forward to that heaven um, um, among them myself. <laughs> Way to go, Nat. Yeah, yeah, I've... I've I've eaten uh, I've I've I have tasted of the hubugo myself and uh, and I think I could uh, survive in that heaven for the first fifty yeah, exactly. minutes. So I literally, I literally tired of that ham so quickly. It was yeah. it's everywhere. It is so ubiquitous in Spain and uh, and it's delicious a couple times. <laughs> but you you probably still have the grease in your mouth. It just cannot be. You cannot get rid of it. So, if you want to, if you want to join the ranks of the the gnats of the world and go to a, a, a cured meat heaven of your own kind, you can just go to howtoheretic.com, Go to the support us link. Click it. That's the Patreon. Put all the money you've got in there. Hit daily. Whatever you got to do. And uh, support us that way. And if you can't do it, or even if you can, please give us five stars anywhere you can. iTunes, Stitcher. It just helps the good people of the world find their way to our little manger, right? Let's move on. Well, Dan. Y- yes? I, we've talked about this before, but remember when <coughs> when we were kids, I think we talked about it when we were doing Exodus with you. There, there was a film that was kind of horrific called The NeverEnding Story. <laughs> and, and then that was bafflingly followed up by The NeverEnding Story Part 2. Uh, where all the unanswered questions about the freaky dra- sperm dragon were, were also not answered. So you're going to give us you're going to get us emails <laughs> yeah. by shitting on that show. Well, somebody sent me a, a, an email when we did it, talked about it last time that that dragon is in a museum. Was it or did you say that? It's no, a I said it. in Germany. It, it, yeah, yeah, you yeah. can go and visit that ugly, terrifying white yeah. dog dragon. It, As, that, that, I, those special effects didn't hold up in the moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. They, but it was cute. They were, they were obsolete live. <laughs> so, so anyway, Doug, the never-ending story, part two, Genesis, the regenesising, <laughs> the revenge yeah. of Begat. Let's close it out. Yeah, like so yeah. many biblical uh, and biblically themed stories, I think the, the, the real true uh, impetus should be, let's just get this fuck over with. Um, <laughs> right. So, uh, yes, Genesis part two, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through the second half of the book of Genesis today and be done with it forever. Um, Hooray. Uh, when last we left off, we had managed to slog our way through roughly the first half of the book of Genesis. We covered creation, the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel. Some impressive lifespan, some polytheism, and a whole lot of incest. Mm. Um, Sounds delicious. Yeah. Well, look, Doug, when there are only four people and you want to make more, what are you <laughs> yeah. going to do? There's only four people unless you want to walk over there where there's apparently another city, which happens over <laughs> right. and over. Right. All of a sudden, right? Yeah. Just shh. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you guys just shh. <laughs> so we managed to get through the primeval history of the book comprising the first 11 chapters and put a pretty sizable dent in the ancestral history com- comprising chapters 12 through 50. Oh, fuck. I know. Really? Uh, yeah, it's a brutal book. I'm so glad I was sick. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, we ended with the reveal that Abraham, formerly Abram, and Sarah, formerly Sarai, were, diff- were, were definitely from different mothers, but the same father. Skun dun dun. So, now, listener Jason wrote us to give some context on the names and their meanings. Abra, Abram in Hebrew is for it means many or multitude, which is a strange name for a person. Yes, but Abraham means father of a multitude, so that makes some kind of sense. I don't know why you just don't call him Abraham from the beginning or father of the multitude from the beginning, but that's not my problem. Yeah. Sarai means princess, and apparently so does Sarah. So great, thanks. Um, <laughs> incidentally, Isaac means laughter because I guess his story is so much fun. <laughs> really? It means laughter? Yeah. I know. Well, I'm going to laugh at uh, it. So Sarah, when she heard she was going to get pregnant, laughed. And so that's where that no, comes Isaac, from. Isaac is like, hey, dad, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, oh, what's that? Come on. You don't mean that, do you, dad? <laughs> uh, Jason has apparently, our listener Jason has apparently read this book in excess of 50 times. Why? Yeah, whatever Jason. His pre- yeah, j- stop, Jason. Calm down. What are you you've, doing? You've done enough. Uh, he I, was I, I, he was did, on a moon base, and this was the only book there was. <laughs> Have so. you heard of the Twilight series? Come on, man. Yeah, anything. 
So just to recap. Daniel Steele wrote a wonderful series of books you might enjoy. <laughs> Fifty with quite Shades a bit of, of Anything But This. Quite a bit of begatting as well. So. I think after half of Fifty Shades of Grey, I might go back to Genesis. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> after 25 Shades of Grey. Um, so just to recap, Abraham raped his servant Hagar whose son Ishmael would go on to be the progenitor of Muhammad and therefore Islam. Yeah. And then Isaac with his half-sister who would go on to be the progenitor of Israel and eventually Jesus and Christianity. Just worth noting that the provenance of the three great monotheistic religions are rape and incest. Um, Doi. I could have told you that without very, <laughs> very on brand. Very on brand. Yeah. Uh, the first 20 chapters of this book is to have taken us from creation of the universe to Abraham. The next 30 mm. chapters will take us from Abraham to Joseph, his great-grandson. So, 30 chapters? Yeah, let's just say the narrative slows down considerably at this point. Yeah. Well, hopefully from, you don't. No. From the, <laughs> the galloping clip it was at. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, was, it would sail through like 800-year-old people's lives. So yes. I think yeah. it was going quick for a minute. Not, not a lot happens in an 800-year lifespan. <laughs> Uh, in order to prevent a mass exodus of listeners from this show, I'm going to stomp on the gas pedal pretty hard or, here. Or guest hosts. Or guest hosts. <laughs> so let's pick up the narrative in chapter 21 where the very old Sarah finally conceives a son and they name him Isaac. Yay. Sarah decides that Hagar and Ishmael need to get kicked out of the house because I guess she's a good guy. <laughs> Here's what's crazy. Ishmael only exists because Sarah demanded that Abraham rape his slave. Right. And because Sarah and Abraham are half brother and sister... Ishmael is not only her stepson, but her nephew uh, that she's <laughs> kicking out. So, And she's her own grandpa. Exactly. Uh, chapter 22 is the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. This story yeah. is so well known that I will not dwell on it, except to say that it's a very short chapter. And the actual taking of Isaac, tying him up and nearly gutting him takes only the first 16 verses. Mm. It's a very dry clinical recitation story, almost like a police report. That's what this whole, the Bible is just... You go then for this, you go this. for thousands of pages or words without anything, right. and then the, the, you finally get to a story you recognize, and it is thirteen sentences, and then it's done. Exactly. And yeah. So God, any, God wrestling with uh, 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 who was it? Uh, Jacob on the edge of the river. It just happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, we, and we will get to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, any hesitation or reluctance on the part of Abraham is editorial. And by the way, no mention whatever of Isaac's perspective on all of this. No. Who cares? No. Sarah dies at 127 years old. Oh, so young. So young. Now, except for the fact that she is one of the most developed characters in the Bible, female characters in the Bible, we don't know much about Sarah, but what we do know is that she was a terrible person. So, (laughs) sayonara, Sarah. (laughs) Well, Um, she fit right in. She fit right into the culture of the time. Um, Servants of Abraham return to Mesopotamia to find a wife for Isaac that's not a dirty Canaanite. They settle on Rebecca. Um, They don't know how old she is, but she's definitely a virgin. And in a very unexpected twist, Rebecca's mother and brother ask her for her consent to marry her off. Weird. Yeah. What? What's yeah. going on? I know. It's weird. She says yes and returns to Canaan and marries Isaac. Rebecca, who initially was barren, then gives birth to twins, Esau and Jacob. You know, everybody's literally uh, barren until it's- they have kids. <laughs> <laughs> is that true? <laughs> Every woman in the world is barren until they... Uh, until they get pregnant. Doesn't it's, that mean unable to have children? Well, no. I mean, it's well, clearly she wasn't barren because she did have children. It's, so. Schrodinger's, fe- it's Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's fetus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Jacob, by the way, means deceiver, and that's what we call foreshadowing. Skunton done. Again, shout out to listener Jason. Uh, also, like, people would name their child deceiver. I know, <laughs> like, right? you're a baby. You don't know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this little shit, I thought he was coming one way, he went the this other. my son, John, and my other son, failure. Um... <laughs> Uh, after a hard days of work uh, in the fields, Esau enters Jacob's tent and begs for something to eat, to which Jacob agrees for the low, low price of his birthright, which <laughs> Esau happily trades for some bread and lentils. Yep. Chapter 26 sees a famine in the land, causing Isaac to take his household to the land of Gerar. And for the third time in this cursed book, someone tells their wife to pretend to be their sister. Isaac tells Rebecca to pretend to be his sister instead of his wife. And for the third time, the king of the city finds out and is pissed. <laughs> and notwithstanding his significant wealth, they expel him from the city. I, was, I still maintain it's a good subterfuge. It's a good idea. I suppose. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great trick. Uh, now, neither Jacob's stealing of Esau's birthright nor Esau's marriage to a non-Hebrew seem to matter at all. Because chapter 27 begins with an ailing Isaac begging Esau 
to hunt him some tasty venison so he can eat it and then pronounce his final blessing on him. So in spite of everything, Esau was going to inherit all the blessings of his father anyway, even though he sold his birthright. But while Esau is off hunting, Rebecca, without a moment's hesitation, hatches a plan that we've talked about to trick Isaac into giving his blessing to Jacob. She sends him off to make some stew while she finds fur- some furs for him to wear in his presence. Because, you see, so Isaac is essentially blind, and Esau was covered in hair like Robin Williams, while Jacob was as hairless and smooth as Jeff Bezos. So, <laughs> the subterfuge works, and mistaking Jacob for Esau, Isaac gives all the blessings to the wrong son. When Esau returns and finds out what has happened, he plans to kill Jacob. And as we've learned, tricks count. Yes. Even, even as a kid, I was like... <laughs> How what? hairy do you have to be <laughs> right. that either a sheep or a goat? Literally, is... he, wa- he used to walk into his father's tent like. <laughs> yeah, that is a fur-bearing animal. That is like their their fur is harvested to make everything. Like, I know that's exactly. The stupidest. I'm sorry. It's so I, stupid. I've detected. I've detected a plot hole. But anyway, go on. <laughs> So uh, while out hunting for a wife, Jacob has a dream. It's the, fa- the famous Jacob's Ladder that angels are using to scale up and down from heaven. That's kind of it. Uh, in this dream, yeah, God there's no we, – and there's kind of no anything to that, right? No, there's there's no, not really any metaphor to it. It's just kind of there. Until, yeah. they, until they invent Jacob's Escalator, which will be cool. <laughs> and then Trump. <laughs> <laughs> So if you were just thinking, you know, it's been a while since rape and incest made an appearance, I give you chapter 29. (sighs) Jacob sees the youngest daughter of his uncle Laban, named Rachel, the brother of his mother, and falls for her. He promises seven years of service to earn the hand of Rachel, but on his wedding night, it turns out that Laban had sneakily put his oldest daughter, Leah, in Jacob's bed, and without noticing, he consummated the marriage with the wrong sister, also known as rape. Yeah, c- well, because <laughs> I generally don't notice who's in the bed with me. I just stumble in drunk and fuck whatever's there. <laughs> Old Testament <laughs> That's antics. That's a half-truth. <laughs> Classic. And again, tricks count. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Laban demands seven more years of service for Rachel, and then he can have both sisters. Jacob fulfills the additional years and gets Rachel, but wouldn't you know it, she's barren. Oh, Just to be clear, oh. Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob have all married barren women who eventually bear children. So this is either some heavy-handed metaphor or Aaron Brockovich needs to test the water supply. <laughs> um, Leah, the older sister of Jacob, or the older sister who uh, uh, Jacob apparently hates, still bears him sons, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. Chapter 30 might, chapter 30 might, might as well be its own channel on porn, uh, Pornhub. A distraught, childless Rachel sends her servant to be raped by Jacob multiple times and bears him two, two more sons. Not to be outdone, Leah sends her servant in to be raped by Jacob multiple times, bearing him two more sons. By the way, weirdly, both of these sex slaves have names, Bilha and Zilpa. Yeah. Finally, Rachel has a son and calls him Joseph. Oh, chapter 32. Jacob <laughs> decides to return and try to beg forgiveness from Esau, who's not having it and sets out with 400 men to kill Jacob. Right. Jacob prepares a gift for Esau to try and temper his anger. The gift consists of 200 she-goats, 20 he-goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milch camels and their colts, 40 kine, 10 bulls, 20 she-asses, and 10 foals. Which honestly... No yeah. he-asses? Where are the he-asses? <laughs> seems what like more get, trouble than What do you worth. get for the guy that has everything? You know, it's like... Uh, <laughs> we all face this conundrum, you know, around Christmas or a birthday. It's like, a pen, a watch, I don't know. She-goat. How about 20? Yeah. How about 40 kine? <laughs> um, so while he's waiting to confront Esau, he, all of a sudden, is wrestling with someone all night long. Yeah. This is the angel that <laughs> Which, Mark referenced. You know how you're chilling... You're like on the way to somewhere, and then you're just wrestling with a dude. Just bump into a dude. And you're, like, you're like, oh, let's yeah. wrestle. Let's grapple. Oh, it the happens. Ra- that's a grapple. The wrestle. It happens on. so suddenly in the narrative that if you just blinked for half a second, you could completely miss it. Yeah, honestly, I had to go like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa is that that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, as the sun rises, neither Jacob nor the stranger have the upper hand. The match finally comes to an end when they touch the in the hollow of each other's thigh. Mm, okay, how do you do that? I don't, don't know. And this uh, is, I think this is the origin of all BYU sex, not sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're docking, you're floating, you're BYU can just, float. You're... Can I just touch the hollow of your thigh? <laughs> yeah. Please? Not anymore. <laughs> Thanks, me too. Um, <laughs> Jacob demands a blessing from this <laughs> I don't even it's know what that time, means. It's about time me too caught up to the Old Testament. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. Okay, keep going. Uh, Jacob demands a <laughs> blessing from this stranger who renames him Israel, meaning God contends. <laughs> because if you wrestle someone, they get to name you. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> well, also, if you... I love wait, the idea. Shouldn't you... Shouldn't you have to win? No, shut up. Yeah. I agree. Shouldn't name the winner George. get to rename somebody? It's like, we fight to a draw and get to rename each other. <laughs> the fuck I is would, that? I would love slash hate to live in the society where that was just the way of things. Yeah. Like if I can wrestle somebody to the ground, I can call him Nancy from now on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, Hello, so, Jacob. Eh, it's Nancy now. Don't even ask. I had a crazy day. <laughs> Did you I wrestle somebody? By, I got jumped by the river. <laughs> So, in chapter 33, Esau finally confronts Jacob, but overcome with love, hugs and kisses him and accepts him back into the land. Aw. So, the answer to the question, who are the good guys in this book, apparently Esau is the only good person in this book. Hmm. Um, chapter 34 begins with some more rape. Hamor the Hivite rapes Dina, the daughter of Leah. <laughs> this rape would kick off a cycle of violence and mayhem that allegedly, lasts... Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the word they use is defile. Uh, the, the cycle of violence kicked off by this rape will uh, last to this day. So, Hamor demanded that Dinah now marry his son, Shechem. Dinah's brothers, Simeon and Levi, initially agreed to the marriage. If, if, every male in the city is circumcised. For some reason, Hamor agrees. And while the men are all re- are, uh, convalescing, Simeon and Levi kill them all. Not only do they kill the men, they sack the city and take all the women and children as sex slaves. It's a great ploy. Yeah. Wow. This, you this thought it be- couldn't get worse than getting the tip of your dick cut off. <laughs> <laughs> this will become a well-exercised muscle going forward. Um, so, the sons of Jacob, by four different women, are as follows, and not in order. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, Joseph, Benjamin, Dan, Nephtali, Gad, Asher. These would go on to be the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, later on, Joseph's sons Manasseh and Ephraim are added to the list. Not clear how that still equals 12, but okay. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> right. um, it's, it's new math. So from this it's point common on... common core. You don't understand <laughs> it. From this point on, the whole rest of the book is the story of Joseph, his colorful coat, and his exploits in Egypt. This story is very, very boring, so let's just <laughs> recap it. So let's, so let's make a musical about it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Joseph was the apple of his father's eye, prompting his brothers to sell him into slavery and fake his death. As you do. As you do. That's what they did with you, Doug, isn't it? I wish. <laughs> Jesus. Well, <laughs> Sold it's into slavery more complicated would have been such a that, step up we'll, for me. We'll cover it another time. <laughs> um, being eventually sold into Egypt, Joseph rises through the ranks mostly because of his ability to interpret dreams. He is eventually called upon to interpret the dream of the Pharaoh, which he does. The interpretation is that there will be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. He convinces Pharaoh to store up a fifth of everything for the impending famine. Impressed, the Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of this effort, making him one of the most powerful people in Egypt. Until they have one hundred billion dollars <laughs> stored exactly. away. Exactly. And for this no story reason. this story led uh, United States Cabinet Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Ben Carson, to publicly state that the pyramids of Giza were built by Joseph to store grain. If only there was some way we could see inside. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. their, their enormous storage capacity. Oh, my God. Again, I can't think of a less useful storage shape than a pyramid, but that's me. Well, well an upside least, down one would be good. At I least mean, a hollow one would be good, well, but they're not. <laughs> I mean, look in your closet. How many storage boxes do you have right now shaped like a pyramid? But just that's just me. I'm six. just saying it's a funnel. If gravity worked the other way, it'd be great for like just releasing yeah. some out. Then, then you got a hopper. Then you got a hopper. And then yeah, you that's can what I'm saying. There you go. Yeah. So a quick side note. Chapter 38 has the famous story of Judah's children, Ur and Onan. Ur committed mm, some unspecified yeah. crime for which God just fucking kills him. <laughs> right. Just so Onan straight up just off the bitch. God says, boom. So Onan takes his wife, but fearing to get fearing getting her pregnant, spills his load on the floor, prompting God mm. to kill him too. So you know, don't masturbate. <laughs> his sperm is sacred. So uh, the story, as the story unfolds, there is intrigue, incest, and deception. The famine arrives and becomes so bad that it hits Canaan, forcing the remaining sons of Jacob to go to Egypt and barter for food. And wouldn't you know it, they end up at the feet of Joseph, although he doesn't t- uh, reveal his identity for a little while. He toys because them because he's covered himself in camel hair. <laughs> He toys with them for a bit until he finally reveals himself and forgives them. They have a grand old party, and Joseph invites the whole house of Jacob to come and live out the famine in Egypt where he can provide for them. The entire house of Jacob migrates to Egypt. Jacob pronounces his final blessing, blessings on the heads of his children, and he dies. 
Mm. The whole book ends with Joseph dying at the age of 110. Seems sprightly. So now that the table set, the entire house of Jacob, which is now the house of Israel, is living in Egypt, the end. Of course, by verse 11 of, the ne- of, a chapter, of Exodus chapter 1, the Pharaoh puts them all in bondage, but that's a story for another day. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's it. We did it? We did it. Oh, my God. I, 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 I just freely admit, and listeners who might want to write in, I did skip a lot of things. I <laughs> skipped <laughs> over fair amounts of the narrative. Listen, you didn't skip over any more than all of the pastors who have ever taught <laughs> Christianity. <laughs> point. Yeah. Um, so, again, just to reiterate the messages in this book, and this is the, the partial list from last week with some augmentation. Man is made in God's image. Man is separate from and has dominion over all life on earth and earth itself. Introdu- introduction of the concept of original sin and how it's the bitch's fault. Marriage is only for men and women. Women come from men and are subservient. Black and brown people are descendants of Cain and cursed. Acceptability of polygamy. Advocacy of genocide. Circumcision. A complete endorsement of slavery and the acceptability, acceptability of incest and fear of masturbation. Thanks, Genesis. Yay. Yeah. It's, it just it, it keeps on giving. It's a good book. <laughs> it's yeah. the good book, really, when you think about it. And it's in the bin. All right. <laughs> it's in the bin. All right, everybody. Thanks, Doug. With that uh, very clear narrative, let's move on. Well, friends, that's it for this week's show. Hey, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email at howto at howtoheretic.com. Or if you were one of the live models for the Hieronymus Bosch uh, Garden of Earthly Delights <laughs> paintings and uh, dated a crab-based woman, please leave us a voicemail about it at 903-88-HOW-TO, which is 903-884-6986. I'm also on Twitter at howtoheretic. And thanks to our awesome patrons. And thanks to Cody Layton for editing the show. And thanks to you, dear friends, for tuning in. Bye, friends. Bye. Bye.